Hi everyone, welcome back to day two, the second session. And the theme today is open workflows. And we'll have now our keynote in the OHBM Open Science Room. And we're very excited to welcome you back as a global community. If you wanna uh, check in again, again on some information that we provide on this slide, you can see the link to our website where you can find more information about the keynote speaker and other speakers as well as the schedule and uh, other relevant information. You can share everything you experience here in the Open Science Room widely um, on Twitter. Uh, we have uh, hashtags there for you, OHBM2020 and o hashtag OSR. You can also join the discussion in Mattermost. Um, there's a general uh, discussion room and also a discussion room that's particular for this theme of day two of the Open Science Room. So in today's keynote, we'll be taking an in-depth look at a end-to-end -to -end reproducible workflow. We'll have one speaker who will be presenting for 25 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes for live Q&A. Uh, the speaker may be available for Q&A in this time zone. If they're not, we'll endeavor to get any questions asked to them, sent over to them one way or another. So we'll use Crowdcast as the main platform for our uh, questions and answers. Um, you can use the text-based uh, function there to add questions and you can upvote them. If you're not able to use Crowdcast, you can also post, uh, post your questions in the OHPM uh, platform if you're using that or any of our other streaming, um, sorry, no, not our streaming platforms, you can also post it in Mattermost. Um, if you're using Crowdcast, we would love to get your feedback. Um, uh, either through Crowdcast or, or otherwise. We'll have some live polls in Crowdcast where you can um, add feedback to say what you thought of uh, this particular content of the speaker, but also of the OSR in general. And then also we would like to remind you um, that uh, uh, we would love for everyone to treat, to treat each other with respect and kindness in the um, virtual open science room. Uh, we all signed the code of conduct um, or, and agreed to uh, abide by it when we registered for this event. And if you see or experience any of any violations um, uh, with regards to the code of conduct, then please report that using the reporting um, structure or process that's identified in the code of conduct on the OHBM website. So now it's my pleasure to hand over to our keynote speaker for this open workflow session. Aga Karakuzu, and he'll be uh, presenting transparent MRI workflows from scanner all the way to publication. So thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to uh, interacting with you in the Q&A session. Hello, everyone. I'm Aga Karakuzu from Polytechnic Montreal. And in this presentation, I'd like to talk about building workflows that are transparent from scanner to publication. I'm a PhD student at Neuropoly Research Lab, co-PI'd co by my supervisor, Nicolas Tico and Julian Koenadat. My PhD project is about standardization of quantitative MRI methods for microstructural brain imaging through open software development. And in my project, QMR Lab is the software responsible for fitting and simulating quantitative MRI data. Combining it with these sub-modules, QMR PulseEgg and QMR Flow, my aim is to create workflows that are transparent all the way from scanner to publication. Almost all research practices in our lab are open source centric. These are other software developed by Neuropoly under supervision of Dr. Koenadat for spinal cord imaging deep learning based segmentation of um, uh, axon images and also real-time shimming. Besides my PhD work, I'm trying to contribute to science communication as much as possible. I'm doing this for MRM highlights, uh, ISMRM's MR Pulse blog, and also for OHBM blog. So now, imagine this globe as a neuroimaging study. When we look from afar, we can clearly see the data how statistical analysis and visualization were done. However, when it's surrounded by the mostly cloud atmosphere of publishers, it is likely that some of these entities are going to be obscure. On the other hand, we all know that neuroimaging globe is multi-layered. 
as I said, on the surface, we have statistical analysis, data visualization, and if we did a cool job, even some interactive summary. We can easily make this layer transparent using open source scripting languages such as R, Python, and Octave. Then we can share them in Jupyter ecosystem with interactive figures and even serve them on cloud thanks to BinderHub. When the crust is transparent, we can see the next layer, which is processing. We have an arsenal of powerful open source tools to extract information from our MR images thanks to the generous researchers who made their tools freely available. So SPM, FSL, MRTRIX, free server, these are just to name a few. Vision of these developers gives us a clear view of the second layer. The next layer is quality control, which is definitely less famous than the previous one. But we can benefit a great deal from quality control reports, again, generated by open software. In retrospect, they can help us identify the origin of unexpected outputs, or they can function as a checkpoint to include or exclude MR images in the analysis. So this is probably the deepest many brain research studies extend to, because when we keep digging, we enter the underground of MRI physicists. All the brain images we see are the end products from this floor, reconstruction, Normally, it is an integrated part of all the commercial available MRI scanners. But if we can somehow get our hands on case-based data, we can use open source, open source software such as BART and Gadgetron to bring transparency to this layer too. Then here comes the final boss, the acquisition. At this level, we are talking about the software that drives the hardware of our scanner the source code that makes the noise. It determines how MRI physics are played out. So no wonder why it's going to be wrapped in this pitch black coating of vendors. It is not transparent at all. And it is quite unlikely that we can make it fully transparent. But fortunately, we have some earth movers named Gamma Star, Palsag, and RT Hawk to tear a hole into that proprietary coating and play out MRI physics on the scanner using open source scripts. Depending on how many of these layers we streamline in, fit, in which fashion, we create a variety of neuroimaging planets. So unlike many people attending this conference, I'm a bit alien to advanced fMRI applications. That's why the planet of quantitative MRI is the most Earth-like to me. And my examples will mostly revolve around this globe. I want, you, I want to show you the transformation I dream for this planet where I am flown. From an opaque globe immersed in the mostly cloud atmosphere of publishing to a transparent planet that allows us to see every layer from scanner to publication under a clear sky. While studying the physics of this planet at some point, I came to learn about the gravitational waves. These waves are rippled across the universe by whales, whales named Docker, holding together the transparent layers of our neuroimaging planets. These waves are containers, and they give us a lightweight packaging mechanism to create consistent runtime environments across operating systems. On planet Earth, these containers have an ocean of applications. We unknowingly benefit from these tools every single day. Imagine just Google by itself runs more, several billions of containers in a week. And these containers are run for us to do a web search on Google or watch, watch a YouTube video, and then to connect us to the event stream on an Uber ride back home and to recommend us new TV shows on Netflix when we finally call it a day. But how do we foster the use of containers in transparent workflows? Now I'll, I'll take you on a journey towards the center of a neuroimaging planet to take a look at containers that fall under the umbrella of transparent workflows layer by layer. So again, on the surface, we have statistical analysis and data visualizations, and we are looking at them behind the clouds of publishers. To bring transparency here, we can start by sharing our scripts, generating the data that we are going to feed into visualization. 
And these scripts are commonly written in Python or sometimes in Octave. And all of them can be shared on GitHub, either in their native scripting format or in Jupyter Notebooks for better representation to interleave code with context. Then we need a set of instructions to distribute our repository with, with, with a consistent runtime environment. And these instructions can be a set of custom configuration files that are recognized by repo to Docker or a generic Docker file. So now we have code, we have runtime, and now we need our input data. We can use Datalat to have version controlled access to our data that we can host in public data repositories such as Open Science Framework, Zenodo, or OpenNero. So this completes the puzzle to repeat the final statistical analysis. And such an easy code ex execution to see how statistical analysis played out is definitely cool. But can we step up our game in this final stage and give people a way to interactively explore our results without having to wait for downloading a data set or waiting for a code runtime? So let's take a look at the spectrum of data visualization and see at which level we need to operate to achieve this. So level zero is quite old fashioned in neuroscience, I believe, because I never had a colleague creating figures in Microsoft Excel for their papers. I guess the level one is currently the most common one to create code-based static figures using Python libraries such as Matplotlib or Pandas or Octave MATLAB. But nowadays, I think we have more and more people picking up on the idea of preparing interactive figures. And what I like uh, about interactive figures the most is that they come with the data they map on a digital canvas. So for example, as a reader, I have a way to see how correlations would have changed after removing a few data points from a scatter plot. Moving forward, if my final results uh, require navigation along multiple dimensions, then I can use dashboards to give readers a kind of cockpit to interact with different facets of my results. And it would occupy the same area on my screen as a static figure would. I think levels two and three hit the sweet spot for research because as we proceed, we enter the territory of visual artists who can use professional graphic design tools to create data art or build some tailored instrumentation to create interactive experiences that may give you a way to drink your data or even dance with it. So we get to choose our data visualization from levels one to three. And to do that, this is the path I enjoy following to visualize my results. I depart from the Plotly and see high level express library or the standard graphing libraries can give me what I want. If not, I move forward to Dash and create a dashboard, then if I want to put it in a blog post, I go ahead and deploy it to production uh, using GitHub Actions and Heroku's free plan, which is super easy and convenient. But remember, after even after going all these lengths, they will be shadowed by the clouds of publishers. Because it's 2020, and the most refined output of our work still goes into a static PDF. How can I make these eventful objects go hand in hand with my publications? To puff away these clouds, we are working on a publishing venue called Neurolibre, which is sponsored by Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform. It, is, it has BinderPub under the hood, and it gets its nifty look from Jupyter Books. We envision a super easy submission pipeline for it, where you start out by filling a form pointing us to the GitHub repo with your notebooks and to where your, uh, to tell us where your data is uploaded. Then we run some automated checks, fork your repo, do a technical peer review, and publish your work. You can associate a neural library with an existing paper or with an interactive tutorial. We are getting close to work with some journals. Aperture is obviously one of them, but also with magnetic resonance in medicine and plus computational biology. Now that the first layer is transparent, let's take a look at the second one. This floor of neuroimaging globe is a wide open space with many different tools, some for pre-processing, some for post-processing, some for both. And lucky that we have a tall friend who can help us draw a roadmap, roadmap to get through it. Giraffe tools are a collection of web-based applications to ease creating image processing pipelines 
I choose this as an example because I think it's a nice summary of good practices at the level of image processing. After we decide on which software to use, the giraffe calls his friends Porcupine and the famous Python of Nypipe to help us visually construct the workflow. These are going to be the steps. And then the good old Docker whale shows up and puts the software in a container along with the description of how Nypipe ties them together. With all the software that we need streamlined horizontally in one Docker image, we set, set out on an image processing adventure to bring transparency to the second layer of our globe. So having access to, access to a tool that can easily streamline multiple software in this fashion is definitely user, useful. But as, as software developers, we can adopt some really simple and useful DevOps to create containers that can be used for streamlining software vertically. By vertical, I mean across layers of neuroimaging globe. And GitHub Actions makes it pretty easy. At each release, we can trigger the build of Docker images tag with the release version and push them to the Docker Hub. And adoption of this simple operation by many software developers can bring consider considerable modularity to our workflows. For QMR Lab, I build three different images for different, to different needs. To keep it minimal, I ship it with Octave only. To use it in notebooks, I blend it in the Jupyter ecosystem. And to make it GUI, which is developed in MATLAB, accessible to everyone, I create one image with MATLAB compiler runtime. Then we can also run tests in these environments to ensure the functionality as we ship them in the same environment. So this is highly convenient. As ensuring the transparency of processing matters to a great deal, so does doing sanity check on the data to be consumed by the processes and creating visual reports. This is an example from an Marathon project to do quality check on magnetization transfer saturation data, which is a quantitative uh, MRI method to measure myelin content. We have three sets of anatomical images, each of them acquired at different scanning parameters. And we'd like to quickly compare them and to see if the contrast difference between these three sets of images makes sense. And then we can also overlay them to infer the magnitude of between scan motion. One of the terms whose definition immediately changes between OHBM and ISMRM is the raw data. In OHBM, raw data refers to untouched images, whereas when we say raw data, MRI physicists think of this. So this is an example data from ISMRM Reproducible Research Study Group 2019 challenge. You are looking at a non-Cartesian case-based data and coil sensitivity to profile images from multiple channels. I created a Docker environment that includes BART and prepared a notebook to implement a non-Cartesian sense parallel reconstruction algorithm. And in the final image, you can see how different undersampling uh, rates affect the reconstruction and the difference between the very first and the final iteration of this process. It's accessible on Binder at this link. So, even after making all the previous layers transparent, we finally reached the core of our neuroimaging globe, covered by pitch black coating of vendors. Now I will show you how we tear a hole into that coating and control the scanner. This is a 3TC mass Kyra system. On the right, you see the native workstation. It's pretty restricted to run custom operations on this machine. And on the left is a powerful workstation running Ubuntu. This is connected to the, work, uh, to the native work, workstation on the right with a simple Ethernet hub. So imagine one of the windows on your workstation is the user interface to the scanner. And you can open a terminal to the site and clone a pass sequence from GitHub. And this is exactly what I did. This is a pass sequence that I developed for T1 mapping. It is based on a super simple 3D spoiled gradient echo sequence. And here I visualized all the RF and gradient waveforms along with the looping logic of the sequence using a free software called SpinBench. And then the source code for reconstruction and the acquisition logic was written in JavaScript 
I also designed a little user interface in the Qt framework. Before running the sequence, maybe I should talk about T1 mapping a bit. So why would I care about quantifying numbers? On the left, we have a typical T1-weighted structural image. And the one on the right is a T1 map displaying longitudinal relaxation time parameter in seconds. So as you can see in the color bar, it ranges from 0 to 3.5 at 7 tesla. So now imagine that I'd like to do a rough segmentation of white matter without any dedicated processing software. For T1-weighted images, all I know is that white matter is going to appear brighter than the rest of the image. And given that the image is in arbitrary units, I make a bold guess and threshold intensities at 50% and get a white matter segmentation like that. But when I'm looking at a T1 map acquired at 70, I know that average T1 in white matter should be around 1.3 seconds, so that when I filter voxels between 1.1 and 1.4 seconds, I get a much better uh, white matter image. So thresholding a T1 mated image at 50% to hit white matter voxels could simply fare, fail for various reasons, such as intersite variability. But the interval we used to uh, for T1 map to choose white matter voxels at 70 would work much robustly across different time points and scanners. And this is exactly the biggest promise of quantitative MRI. T1 is, of course, one of the most fundamental metrics. Using more advanced methods, we can characterize tissue microstructures such as myelin content. So then I placed this quantitative MRI phantom that contains 14 spheres with known T1 values and Hit the run button. So if you're familiar with the sound of the flash sequence, you can tell that it sounds the same. And then when I check the contrast dynamics of the images that are generated by Siemens versus the sequence from GitHub, they also somewhat uh, look similar. Then I went ahead and called my uh, T1 mapping pipeline on the raw data that is saved to the hard disk of my workstation after this scan, which is quite, you know, super highly convenient because normally to have access to raw data on commercial systems, you better pull some tricks. But then I saw that my sequence was severely underestimating T1 values that were higher than 500 milliseconds. But here I definitely laid the blame on myself because it was the very first pass sequence that I developed. But on the bright side, I know that this imperfection in version 1.0 of my application is likely to reproduce when I deploy it to a GE system. And the sequence is on GitHub, open for collaborative development. So anyone uh, who has a better experience in past sequence development can show up and tell me what to do. So the acquisition platform that I use is RTHog, and it's only compatible with CMS and GE at the moment. But there is also Gamma Star, which is compatible with all three major vendors. I recently had a chance to interview the developers of this tool. If you'd like to read it, here is the link. So yeah, with this final component, I have everything I need to vertically streamline a workflow from acquisition, reconstruction, <coughs> quality control, alignment, data fitting, and publication. But I need to construct this workflow a bit differently than what I showed you on the processing floor. I need a vehicle to write gravitational waves that change from layer to layer from core of my neuroimaging globe to its surface. And to do that, I chose Nextflow. Nextflow is a powerful pipeline framework to develop data-driven workflows using a fluent domain-specific language which is modeled around Unix pipe concept. It is commonly adopted among computational biologists, and they are recently awarded uh, by Chan, Chan, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Grant. So these pipelines can extract implicit parallelism, and they can seamlessly orchestrate workloads using Docker or Singularity containers. It is, high, it is quite high, uh, lightweight, and it's portable. And it's highly scalable, thanks to the ex executor abstraction. And this feature makes Nextflow platform agnostic, which means that we can 
use it on our PCs or workstations. It is a built-in Kubernetes support. So we, workflows can be deployed to cloud at ease. And finally, we can map pipelines on high-performance high computing resources as well. So going back to our workflows, we started with acquisition using RTHog, Gamma Star, or POSSEC, which generated a case space data. Then we reconstructed our images, feed it into pre-processing, then post-processing. So if I define the progression of these different tasks by means of which software I choose, I probably cannot come up with a good recipe that can work for different combinations. But if I, sim if I implicitly define task dependencies by process inputs and output declarations, then I can have a generic formula. And for these declarations, using community standards, of course, makes a lot of sense. ISMRM raw data can be used for case space images. And for every other type of data, we can use brain imaging data structure. Going back to my T1 mapping example, next flow comes with an e e event listener. So when the acquisition is completed, it triggers a workflow by converting case space data into ISMRM raw data format and then calls Gadgetron to perform reconstruction and then convert my data into bits format, which is followed by volume alignment using elastics, and finally, QMRLog for performing T1 fitting. So in, in the next flow terminology, data are called channels, and workflows are defined by processes. But here's the cool thing that I like the most about next, next flow. It can isolate these task dependencies by orchestrating data flow between microservices, so which means that every process has its own container. I follow three principles to design next flow pipelines for quantitative MR applications. The first one is that I isolate process logic and definitions from workflow orchestration, and I adhere to one process, one container mapping, and use off-the-shelf containers if they are officially provided by their developers. If not, I create a simple Docker container, usually starting from a narrow Debian base image. And I also use community standards. This is uh, what I do for QMR Flow. And it's a collection of uh, applications for quantitative MRI methods. This one is MTSAT, magnetization transfer saturation ratio for myelin, myelin content, which also creates a T1 map. The workflow starts by picking up a bits formatted file, aligns them, performs brain extraction, and then performs fitting, and finally corrects the imperfections in the measurement with B1 field information. An XFlow pipeline uh, is comprised of three files. So this one is uh, main.nf. It's, it's for the process of simple brain extraction. First, we tell uh, which input files it's going to pick up from which data channel, and also describe which outputs uh, should it expect. Then we, we, we give our scripts. If back recursive is selected, do this. If not, do the, uh, do the other function call and execute the whole process only when users pass use bad parameters as true. We can also capture some information from the file names. In this case, it's subject ID. And we can set the publication directory to the derivatives folder of our bits dataset, for example. Then we have a configuration file. And in this file, I define uh, one Docker container for every process and enable Docker to true. And I can also provide any other kind of um, arguments that are consumed by other software that I use, such as FSL or QMR Lab. So imagine a PhD student who would like to use quantitative MRI in their research project. The traditional way is a hurdle race. Even the sequences are available, they need guidance for data acquisition and then they need to find the correct acronyms, proper scan parameters, and the same goes for data creation and analysis. What I'd like to run and help others run is a sprint race. So it can start with an automatic acquisition using Hard Vista, 
using QMR flow and all these nice next flow workflows to create a quantitative map. Use Plotly, Binder, Docker, and all other tools to create interactive figures and hopefully publish them on Neurolibre and other open publication platforms. I talk about containers quite a bit, so I'd like to finish my representation with a poem dedicated to them. So it goes like, dwelling on MRI and the brain, on a ship with many containers. Crisis of reproducibility is a hurricane, and key to survival is helped by trainers. Ever wanted to repeat now and again? Well, read the first letters and sing the refrain. These are the visual resources that I used in my presentation on Behance, FreePick, and SlideShare. And I'd like to thank all my colleagues in Neuropoly Neuroimaging Lab, Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, and Transmed Tech Institute, and International Society of Magnetic Resonance in Medicine for funding my, funding my PhD work. Thank you so much.